A very good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to you all at our Juice France Investors Day 2021 webinar. We are glad to have you all with us today, and we hope that in next two hours, we are able to answer to your questions, your doubts about why you should choose France as an investment destination for your business expansion in European market. Uh, before uh, we begin, uh, some important po uh, information which I would like to mention here uh, is that especially for the participants, I would request you all to please keep your cameras off and microphones muted during the webinar. Only uh, for the speakers, I would request to please keep the cameras on and especially uh, during their interventions. Also, I would request to all the participants to please uh, put across your questions during uh, the webinar uh, going on during the <coughs> presentations uh, or the interventions and write your questions in the chat box. Uh, rather than uh, intervening in between because it is going to uh, affect uh, the flow of the event. And also, I would request um, all the uh, speakers to put the cameras on. And uh, in the end, towards the Q&A slot, we would like to uh, address to all the questions, whatever you have uh, in the end of towards the end of the session. So thank you very much for this. And I would now request uh, to officially start with our uh, event today. And uh, for, without delaying this further, I would start with the, the uh, welcome address from His Excellency, Mr. Emmanuel Lena, Ambassador of France to India, uh, in the form of a recorded video message, who would like to welcome you all and also highlight some of the key points on attractiveness of Fran France and its competitive advantages. So here we go. Dear friends, dear investors, uh, bonjour, namaste, and welcome to this uh, new edition of Truth Friends Investors Day, organized by Business France with the support of the Indo-French Chamber of Commerce, IFKI, uh, with the support of uh, CII, with the support of uh, YPO, with the support of the full Team France. Um, this year has been a challenging one, of course, and we still uh, are challenged by uh, the pandemic, but still uh, business is uh, going, flowing between the two countries. French companies have been investing over the last two years. They kept on investing. There have been some uh, uh, significant investment in billions uh, to India because they believe in the potential of India. And right now, more than 650 French companies are invested in India, employing roughly 400,000 um, workers and uh, employees in India, and they are thriving. And right now, today, the goal is that we make this a two-way street and that more and more uh, companies from India uh, will seize the opportunity of a French market. Uh, because we believe there are huge opportunities, and that's what investors worldwide believe. Uh, as you know, last year, France was number one destination for uh, foreign direct investment in Europe. And why so? Because the country uh, is becoming the most competitive in Europe. You have a very much pro-business government who is being doing some hardly needed and strong reforms. I mean, reform to make uh, to lower taxation. Now, as you may know, corporate tax has been lowered to roughly 25%. There's a flat tax on capital gain since 2018. Labor laws have been streamlined uh, for, re uh, for redundancies to dismiss. It's much more flexible, much more easier. So you can have the audacity to hire people without thinking that it might be more difficult than to, to go back. Uh, everything is uh, much easier. We have uh, procedures to, uh, to create uh, or to develop activities also are much uh, faster right now in France. And France is the gateway uh, to Europe, the gateway to Africa and, and to many regions in the world. And uh, especially I'm very proud that today uh, we get the special support of, uh, of a very dynamic region in France, which is called the Hauts de France. And as you know, it's uh, situated uh, at the core of Europe. I mean, it has great ports such as Dunkerque, which is a, a big sponsor of this operation. And it's one of the regions who will benefit most from Brexit. 
because Brazdit is a real game changer. And I'm sure that the uh, companies from, from India uh, are now taking fully into account uh, this uh, new dimension when they make their choices for investment in uh, my country. That being said, uh, all the team will be, will be there to help, to assist, to develop your business. And I'm happy that today you will have some feedback from uh, companies who have done very successful uh, investment in France. We have a lot of success stories uh, from Indian companies invested in France. And today uh, I know that uh, uh, reps from Moverson, reps from uh, TCS, uh, reps from uh, Orobindo Pharma and reps from LNT Infotech will share their experience with you. And I'm sure that will be very conducive to new flow of business. Thank you very much and I wish you a very good conference. Uh Thank you. And um, now on that positive note and moving on, I would now request Mr. Eric Pajol, Trade Commissioner and Director of Business from South Asia, who's based in New Delhi, to throw some light on France 2030 massive investment plan unveiled by President Mr. Emmanuel, uh, President of France, Mr. Emmanuel Macron in October 2021, focusing on France industrial future by 2030 and its eco economic recovery too. Merci, uh, Anshika. Good afternoon and good morning to, uh, to everyone. Uh, I hope you can see my, my presentation uh, on the screen, Anshika. Yes, we can see. Okay. So uh, I will, uh, after the introduction of the ambassador, who gave uh, already some information about what the government has done for investors, uh, I will just brief you about the new uh, plan that was launched by the President Macron a few days ago called France 2030. And we, we said, sorry, there's someone with a microphone open. Okay, the France of tomorrow, as we said, start today. You have a new India and we will show you that uh, we have a new France as well. Uh, this plan, 2030, is an answer to great challenges that we are faced during COVID time, and particularly for uh, ecological transition through a massive investment of the government to identify our future technological champions and to support all the transition we need in our sectors of excellence. So for the last five years, the government had a very pro-business agenda making France a more resilient and attractive for, for investors. Just in a few words and few figures, we have uh, done a lot of efforts in terms of infrastructure with the world-class uh, internet broadband uh, that equipped like more than uh, two-thirds of, uh, of the, the people in France. The most competitive electricity rate in Europe, this is a very important uh, parameter for investors. It's a very green energy and is a very cost competitive, the cheapest that you can find in Europe. We have the second largest market uh, and we are the le leading economy with Germany. And uh, regarding the stock exchange, as you can see, we are uh, number one in the Eurozone with Euronext. The talents are also a key part of our attractiveness uh, with a large qualified workforce of 1.7 engineers, scientists and mathematicians. And we know how important are mathematicians for a technology like intelligence, artificial intelligence that is attracting a lot of foreign investment as well in Paris. We have a very high education people and we know we are also a lot of uh, Indian students in uh, our school and universities. This, uh, as the ambassador said, uh, the strong business agenda and the poor business reform were focusing essentially in our uh, weakness was uh, uh, now we have a very uh, low tax for corporates, like it's uh, by January, it will be only 25%. We have a unique system of uh, tax credit for R&D that is one of the most efficient among OECD countries and a flat tax of 70% on capital revenues. 
The government has also invested in a social model. Uh, we are, when I meet um, businessmen in India, they always think that it's difficult to fire uh, people and employees in France. This was France 10 years back. With the new reform in the labor, we have the, a very, a very a flexible and predictable uh, work. Hello, can you be on mute, please? Sir, I'm meeting the room. I have to do much time to under the mute. Okay, I, I will try to continue. Uh, we have a social a security contribution also on low sal salaries that are very low. And we have adapt skills and we have invested a lot in uh, training uh, people. So now also we are facilitating industrial setups. Uh, we have uh, facilitated as well the creation of company in France and removing all the obstacles to growth in business. A lot of all those services, by the way, are online and it's easier for the for the companies and for the investors. So during the COVID time, uh, President Macron had a word saying that whatever it takes or whatever it costs, uh, French government will pay. So for all the investors, even the Indian investors during the crisis in France, the pandemic crisis, they're benefiting from those uh, programs and those funds for the labor, for the cash flow, and for the operating cycle. As you can see, we are dedicated program to support our automotive industry, our tech business, aerospace, and tourism industry. And it was a massive uh, program of the government for the kind of relaunch of the economy. Uh, this plan was 100 billion euro uh, it was targeting for ecological transition, as I said before, decarbonization of industry, energy efficiency, and manufacturing procedures. Uh, competitiveness also to support industrial investment. Lower taxation on production. This is also a very new for France that was done two years ago by reducing all the taxes, taxes in production and cohesion of the of the of the people of France by investing in the youth, investing in the employment of young people and trainings. This has given a lot of result already. You can see that 70% of this 100 billion euro will be, will be spent by the end of this year. We have now the highest rate of growth in the in the eurozone as you can see this was a forecast of imf of 6.3 i think now it's more than that we are around 6.7 uh, forecast for this year that is the first country in europe with such a uh, um, a gross uh, forecast the exports from france are very dynamic as well even better than what we were doing in 20, 2019 and last but not least, we have a, a recover. We, we are rediscovering optimism, optimism uh, because there is less default of businesses, and uh, the share of and the profit are higher than 2018. So, as the ambassador said, but also our minister for foreign trade, France is now the best place to invest in Europe for the second year in a row, and a unique gateway to EU and to. Uh, international markets such as Africa. So that plan of 2030 will uh, be supporting innovation and try to accelerate uh, the, the time between uh, basic research um, and industrial research to the industrialization of the product. The government will put money to accelerate and fast track all those innovation to be able to reach the market as soon as possible with a very limited cycle of, of, um, of a transformation. So as you can see, we have key sectors where the government uh, one is investing. I said these are our sectors of excellence, nuclear power, re hydrogen and renewable energy, decarbonation of the industry, zero emission vehicles, low carbon aircraft, agri-food, biomedicine, disruptive air solutions, cultural and creative contact, and the space industry. I think that 
in all of those sectors, we can find a lot of partnership with our Indian friends for creating a, and reinforcing some collaboration for the Indian market, but also by investing in France for the EU market. So I want to develop more uh, on the, all those sectors. As you can see, healthcare is a key issue for France now. We want to be a leading country for healthcare. Deep tech as well. Deep tech is very important and the government is investing a lot also to industrialize rapidly the innovation of uh, deep tech to, uh, to industrial, industrial sites. Digital, of course, and we have, I think the sector where India is very uh, active in France is uh, digital with TCS, Wipro, Infosys, uh, Infotech, HCL, all the big players of India have invested in France and they are developing their business in France. So digital is the key issue with the 5G as well and uh, uh, other technology that you can find in the eco French ecosystem. Transport and material. So I said uh, greater clean transportation and alternative solution for individual cars, for logistics. It's also a sector where you can find a partnership and good knowledge in France, but also recycling. Uh, recycling is becoming very important now and to put waste to effective use. We have a company from Calcutta investing in south of France in recycling, and they are very happy to uh, extend their business in France for the recycling uh, materials. Uh, hydrogen is a key issue also. The government will put 9 billion uh, euros into hydrogen with two uh, gigafactory of electrolyzers and we need to reinforce collaboration with India on hydrogen industry. As you know, we have a national council that is very effective. We have the support of the EU as well and a good regulatory framework for hydrogen and robotization. Uh, that's also some sector where we have very good uh, companies who can be uh, interesting for uh, investment for Indian partners. Uh, I will finish with agri-food and uh, a sustainable system and to contribute to ecological transition also in the food industry uh, to have a better sustainable and healthy, uh, healthy sector in the farming sector. Uh, I, last but not least, education and, and culture. You know, France is uh, very keen into developing these uh, two sectors of uh, training people and culture. We have also very good opportunities for foreign investors to uh, invest in those uh, new approach of education, e-tech, uh, but also uh, into culture for uh, architecture for a museum for a lot of uh, um, sectors inside the culture. So I will finish by this as uh, our president Emmanuel Macron said France when he came to India France is the entry point to the EU and we want to be India's best partner in Europe. So I think that most of the Indian company can benefit from France 2030 as a lot of subsidiary of Indian companies have benefited already for the last two years of the government recovery plan to support their business in France during the crisis. Uh, there we, we, we don't do any difference between a French company and an Indian company once the Indian company has invested in France. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric, uh, for highlighting the key sectors which Indian investors could look at to develop their business in France and can also benefit from the government support in these sectors. And also for highlighting the, uh, the France structural trends and pro-business reforms that French government uh, had undertaken to attract uh, FDI. Uh, thank you very much. And before moving on, just two important announcements. First, which I forgot to mention that we are recording this session. Uh, so just wanted to let you know all and also please request all of you to be careful with your mi microphones to ensure the seamless flow of the webinar. 
Uh, thank you. And moving on, I would now like to invite Mr. Vincent uh, Refost, Associate Partner, EY Consulting, who's joining us from France and who would like to talk about France, uh, how, uh, why France has become the best place in Europe to invest. And also not to forget that France has been declared as top European destination for new foreign investments for two years in a row now, 2020 and 21, as per the EY Attractiveness Barometer. I now let the expert talk. Over to you, Mr. Rafost. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so I hope you can uh, see me and hear me OK. Let me just uh, share my screen. Can you see my screen? Is that OK? Yes, we can now. Yes. OK, good. So thank you very much. So uh, and thank you for uh, inviting, uh, inviting us uh, today. So I'm going to take you uh, very briefly uh, through uh, a few uh, key highlights from uh, um, a survey that we uh, conduct uh, annually about uh, the attractiveness of France, but you know not only uh, about France. What we uh, do is we publish uh, every year uh, attractiveness surveys about Europe as a whole. So across, you know, not the EU, but the 44 countries of uh, the region of, uh, of Europe. And we do also some uh, country specific surveys. And one of them is France, which is published on a, on a yearly basis. So today I'm going to take you through a mix of uh, key findings between uh, Europe uh, and France. But maybe before that, I will just uh, give you a bit of uh, background of uh, who I am and what we do with our team with EY, so you better understand uh, the, the, the perspective that we're, we're talking from. So I'm part of a team which is very much uh, dedicated to uh, FDI-related work, and it means that uh, half of our clients are countries, regions, and cities, and we help them to attract uh, you know, foreign uh, investors. And the other half of our client portfolio is made of uh, corporate clients. So people like, uh, you know, some of you around the call and we help them make the best uh, location decisions. So we advise them in their uh, location strategies, investment strategies, and we are completely uh, location agnostic, meaning that we are not, you know, doing any promotion of uh, France, especially we're really helping, you know, our clients making the best decision based on their uh, project uh, requirements for you know any kind of activities it can be manufacturing uh, r d headquarters uh, global uh, business services centers and stuff like that so without uh, you know uh, uh, more uh, uh, introduction i'm going to take you through a few uh, key uh, highlights but maybe you should uh, remember three uh, main uh, takeaways from our latest uh, uh, france attractiveness survey that we published uh, back in uh, June of uh, 2021. Uh, the first thing is um, uh, that uh, France is, uh, has been uh, for uh, the, the two last years the number one destination for foreign investment uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, so that's the, the first uh, key, uh, key finding. Uh, and then um, you should also remember that, that France has been the number one destination for foreign investment in manufacturing for the past 10 years. So nobody knows it, but this is what we have uh, observed uh, for the past uh, 10 years. And uh, same for the uh, R&D project. So investment, foreign investment projects made by companies in Europe. France is the number one destination for R&D as well. Uh, uh, even though uh, France is very much um, challenged on that, as you will see in this presentation by uh, the, the UK. So. What you can see here is uh, the picture of uh, the number of investment uh, decision, decisions that uh, are made every year in Europe by foreign investors. So this is a look at Europe as a whole, right? So and we're looking at uh, uh, the period that goes between uh, two, uh, 2005 until 2020. Uh, and this is a, uh, and we're looking at Europe, not, uh, not uh, just uh, France. So it means here that in 2020, uh, Europe has received uh, 5,578 investment uh, projects made by uh, foreign companies uh, in Europe. Uh, this is a decrease of 13% compared to 2019. Obviously, you know, because of uh, the COVID crisis that has put uh, many projects uh, on standby. And this decrease in terms of number of uh, investment projects is quite comparable to what we saw uh, during the financial crisis. So, you know, between uh, 2008 and 2009. Uh, 
Uh, to be honest, we're expecting, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, a more uh, intense drop in investment. So it's in some way, it's kind of uh, good news that it's only 13 percent. We're going to see, you know, uh, where we land uh, in 2021. The next European survey that we will uh, publish uh, will be out uh, late May, early June uh, 2022. So uh, I'm curious to see what will be the trend here. But just remember that, uh, yes, uh, Europe has received uh, 5,578 uh, projects. So greenfield investment, creating jobs locally in Europe. We are not looking at, you know, M&A and financial transaction. It's only, you know, greenfield investment, creating value locally and creating jobs, uh, new jobs locally. Uh, so that's for Europe. Within Europe, uh, as uh, you can see here, this is uh, the... Um, you know, the trend of uh, uh, three countries, the top three countries, uh, the top three destinations in Europe for foreign investment, which are France, UK and Germany. Uh, be aware that uh, the three of them account uh, together for uh, more than 50 percent of all investment decisions attracted into Europe. So they capture more than 50 percent of all investment projects uh, made by uh, foreign companies uh, every year. And as I was saying uh, previously, France uh, is uh, the number one destination or was the number one destination in 2020 with 985 uh, investment decisions that were made uh, uh, in, in France by foreign investors compared to uh, 975 for the UK and 930 for Germany. Uh, you can see here that uh, it's not always been, been the case. France uh, has... Uh, uh, is uh, the first destination and has been the first destination for the last two years, but it was not the case uh, uh, before that. So there is quite a significant increase in terms of a number of projects and attractiveness of France. So hopefully for France, you know, this will continue uh, like this. But as you can see also here, the competition is uh, quite strong between the different uh, leaders of, uh, of Europe, which have quite different uh, attractiveness profiles uh, as well. Uh, this is the, the map, you know, to give you a bit more uh, uh, background about uh, other uh, neighbor countries uh, uh, apart from uh, the UK and Germany. Uh, just uh, remember that uh, the dynamics, the investment dynamics or attractiveness dynamics are quite different from uh, one country to another. Uh, those countries that uh, kind of uh, resisted better the COVID crisis are those countries which are very highly positioned on especially all the uh, back office kind of uh, activities um, uh, like uh, Poland, for instance, like uh, Portugal, for instance, and so on, which have uh, proven to be more uh, a bit more uh, uh, not resilient, but, uh, you know, uh, absorbing uh, the, the shocks of uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, this is really related to their investment uh, or attractiveness profile. Uh, and for the rest, uh, you can see that uh, the 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 the, the landscape is uh, made of a very uh, uh, a wide variety of a country with uh, different attractiveness profiles and hence attractiveness dynamics. Uh, now, going to, uh, you know, what I was saying about uh, France being the number one destination for manufacturing. So here you can see that France has attracted in 2020 341 investment projects in manufacturing from, you know, foreign companies which is a decrease by 17%, but still, you know, it manages to, uh, to uh, maintain its uh, number one, uh, number one uh, ranking. And for R&D, uh, as I was saying, France is also the number one destination country, even though uh, the UK is uh, very closely, you know, uh, competing uh, with France with just one project uh, uh, gap between the two countries. So uh, it means that, uh, you know, uh, uh, competition is there uh, definitely for this kind of uh, very strategic uh, activities and, and business functions. So uh, clearly, you know, there is a race uh, that will uh, continue in the coming years for these activities. But, you know, what uh, Eric just presented will probably help, you know, uh, playing, you know, in favor of the attractiveness of France for uh, this kind of uh, for R&D uh, centers uh, type of uh, activities. And this is, you know, I think this is my last uh, slide about uh, the, the future and how investors are seeing. So this is from the survey that we do with uh, foreign investors about uh, the attractiveness of uh, 
of France and the attractiveness of Europe. So what we've asked uh, our panel of foreign investors is when do you see you know, a full recovery of investment? Just remember that for all of the investors, investors will, will and uh, is and will remain vital. So the question is not uh, whether they will stop their investment, but uh, it's more about where will they put their money, right? And when they will do it. And uh, here we can see that, uh, of course, you know, all the investors will continue to invest um, and they see a full recovery. So when we interviewed them, it was back in March and April of 2021. And at that time, they were telling us that they would see a full recovery of their investment activity, foreign investment activity, by uh, the end of, uh, by the, 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 the second half of 2023. I think we're all learning, you know, still now to uh, cope with uh, uh, the, the, the changes and the dynamics from the, the COVID crisis. The Omicron uh, situation uh, also tells us uh, quite a lot about that. But, you know, just remember that there is, uh, everybody has learned how to uh, cope with that. Uh, and everybody's trying to find, you know, the right ways to uh, uh, overcome the challenges that are that we're all facing with uh, the, this uh, COVID uh, situation and finding alternatives to uh, still invest uh, because this is so vital to all uh, companies. Um, so I think I'm uh, done with uh, this uh, five minutes that I was uh, offered and thank you very much again for that. I hope that was uh, clear enough and I will be happy, you know, to uh, answer uh, any question uh, if needed. In, uh, in due time. And you can, of course, you know, we have uh, all this information on our uh, website. So you have here the link ey.com slash attractiveness, where you can find a number of uh, attractiveness surveys <coughs> and contacts uh, as well for your investment projects in Europe or elsewhere for any kind of activity. So thank you very much for your, uh, for your uh, attention this morning and uh, happy to, to help uh, if there are any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Rofost, uh, for this insightful presentation, along with some very interesting facts and figures, which certainly uh, I believe that the Indian investors are going to retain and will help them making the right decision and right choice for their business. Um, moving on, we now reach uh, to our first round table on how to set up successfully in France from a greenfield to M&A perspective. And for this roundtable, I invite my dear colleague, uh, Ms. Ludivine Noirel, uh, Investment Advisor at Business France, who would be moderating this uh, roundtable. Over to you, Ludivine. Thank you, Anshika. Welcome to our panelist guest speakers for this roundtable about uh, how to successfully set up in France, regardless the project could be Greenfield or linked to m and operations. Today, we have at this table six panelists. Mr. Nicolas Ribollet from CCF, French Foreign Trade Advisor, Mr. Bernard Thézé, partner and lawyer at DS Avocat, Mr. Sébastien Guillot, head of international banking at HSBC Continental Europe, Mrs. Marianne Vlasovic, head of finance export at BPI, and to represent expat partners, Mr. Ruan Kamat, Asia Director, and Mrs. Fiona Mujno, Managing Director. I will ask our speakers to introduce themselves when they begin answer briefly the question I have for them. We also want to give a challenge to our guest speakers to offer very practical aspects of setting up in France for Indian companies and give crisp you know, comments or rentable being about only 30 minutes. Usually, the burning questions start always by the cliché uh, why doing business in France, like the ones around tax and labor law, for instance. So let's start by this aspect, and I'm going to ask uh, Nicola about tax indeed. Nicola, what is the correct image to have of France in terms of tax competitiveness? Could you tell us about the degree of retroactiveness France can have on that aspect? Yes, thank you, Ludivine. Let me uh, let me share my uh, my screen as well. Okay, so yes, you you mentioned about uh, a cliche uh, about France and about the level of uh, of taxation, and I think it's very important to uh, correct the perception uh, that could have been there a few years back about the level of uh, of taxes in um, in France. In respect of uh, taxation in France, there has been 
uh, massive and long-term reduction that have been implemented recently to improve the competitiveness of uh, businesses. In particular, uh, since 2017, the French government has been engaged in a very vast program of uh, structural reforms um, that is transforming the economy, and that includes changes in respect of the tax environment and in terms of administrative simplification. I can highlight here a few uh, very important tax uh, reduction measures that you will see on, um, on screen. First, a very significant one is the uh, gradual reduction in corporate uh, tax. Um, that has been mentioned by, uh, by Eric already, but we are moving from a level that was around 33% to 25% by 2022, and that is converging towards the uh, European average. In 2021, the rate is being reduced to 26.5%, with an exception for businesses with uh, revenue in excess of 250 million, where the rate is one uh, is one point more. Um, the second very important um, tax reduction that is very massive is the reduction in respect of uh, production taxes, that is cutting this taxation product on production in half. Um, this represents around 20 billion. Um, per year of tax reduction in 2021, 2022, and then to, uh, around 10 billion euros in following years. Um, this is benefiting to uh, all businesses that, that are liable uh, for this tax in France, regardless of size and sectors, and is spread with um, reduction in um, corporate value added tax, uh, property taxes on industrial side, and a reduction in the capping rate uh, of the uh, regional economic contribution. So that is benefiting in 2021 to around um, 600,000 businesses that will benefit from this tax uh, reduction. The research tax credit, there was already uh, various mention about uh, R&D, um, and that's a very important system, flagship system that you find in France that is a very strong incentive to make uh, R&D expenses. Um, with that system, you can. Uh, it is possible to deduct R&D expenses for tax purposes of 30%, up to 100 million euros in expenses, and then 5% hereafter. Um, that's a, a system that has been in place in France for uh, for some time, but is very attractive, and that is placing France um, among OECD countries at the second place in terms of R&D financing. So. Uh, if you have to uh, if you have to make uh, R and D expenses, I mean France is a very interesting place for uh, for that. Uh, the fourth one in terms of uh, taxation is the uh, transformation since 2019 of the competitiveness and employment tax credit into a permanent reduction in health insurance social contributions, um, and this measure has contributed to the reduction in uh, labor cost in France, particularly at minimum wage uh, level. Um, so these are the, uh, the incentive. I mean, as you can see from these measures, corporate taxation has been considerably reduced in France in order to encourage investment and facilitate the economic recovery. Um, last point, there are also a number of measures that have been implemented in respect of taxation of individuals. So for Indian investors that would set up in France or who would send expatriates uh, there, um, there have also been a number of uh, significant tax reduction in terms of individual taxation, with the reform of capital taxation, transformation of um, the what was the wealth tax that has been transformed into a tax on real estate uh, wealth, uh, which has uh, restricted the tax base, so it has reduced the tax base on which this tax is applicable. Um, there has been an historic reduction of 5 billion euros in income tax in 2020 and various other measures in favor of employee purchasing power. So as you can see, I mean, the, uh, all the perception from, uh, that, that you may have about tax in France, all of that needs to be revised. Over the last five years in particular, there have been a number of changes, number of tax reductions that uh, any investor, and notably the Indian investor, should consider before making decisions. I mean, France is, uh, is changing um, and implementing a number of, um, number of new measures and administrative simplification that are beneficial for foreign investors. Thank you, uh, Nicolas, for this aspect. You know, now, you know, obviously, uh, our France is famous for uh, labor law, usually. Uh, and I would like to ask Mr. 
Bernard Lézé from DS Avocat. Uh, are, you know, I, I know that some you know, of this ecosystem has changed you know, recently and in that domain. So could you tell us you know, what represents the game changer for a company to hire in France and how to prepare, uh, our, you know, legally speaking, an HR team in that context? Sorry. Uh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, can you hear me? Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for um, uh, giving me the floor, and um, I will uh, answer the question, and maybe uh, I, I carry on the, the presentation uh, uh, just after, or, or what? Uh, um, okay. So let me uh, just um, introduce uh, myself and share um, uh, the. Um, uh, the presentation. Uh, so, um, uh, DS Avocat uh, has been um, uh, is a is a French firm set up in uh, 1972, and we were the first uh, to go to to Asia, uh, uh, and we established in uh, China in 1986. So we are the oldest uh, there. We have also an Indian desk with Liz Bess, um, uh, currently based in uh, in Singapore. Uh, what uh, that's all for uh, for for DS myself I, I was with um, um, a law firm uh, Clifford Chance and a partner after with American firm White and Case before joining DS Avoca in 2008. Uh, answering your question, so um, I'm a corporate lawyer, uh, but I, I uh, often have questions uh, about uh, labor law, which are dealt by my uh, specialized colleagues, but. Generally speaking, uh, a corporate lawyer will explain you uh, how uh, the labor law uh, work. And it's true that the France does not have a very good uh, reputation as far as labor law uh, are concerned. However, as a game changer, I, I would like to, to answer your question uh, shortly. I would like to, to, to mention two uh, key points which were uh, really a game changer. Um, uh, as far as foreign investment is uh, is concerned, the first one is uh, the uh, what we call the Baron uh, Macron uh, schedule, the Barem Macron uh, in French, and this is basically um, a scale which says that if you are terminated, you cannot claim uh, more than a certain maximum amount of damage, and this is uh, a binding rule. Uh, with very little exceptions like discrimination or, or, or very serious stuff, but in general terms, uh, you um, uh, and this is pretty new um, uh, in the French legal system. Uh, so this reform has been uh, very um, uh, important for, uh, for for enterprise to plan the risk of terminating somebody. And basically, the French law uh, is not does not prevent uh, a redundancy, of course, and um, uh, it's uh, you can hire and terminate. Uh, 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 I will not say easily, but uh, uh, it's predictable. And if you follow the process, you can uh, you can get it. In certain countries, I had some uh, uh, matter to to deal with in um, uh, in uh, uh, Spain or Italy. So of course, it has changed. But uh, in Spain, at at some stage, it was impossible to to make uh, collective uh, redundancies. Um, uh, it's no longer the case, but uh, uh, in France it has always been uh, possible. Uh, and you have now a, a kind of um, a scale. The second thing is um, the second game changer, and I will uh, say it uh, shortly, um, uh, is uh, that sometimes you have to consult the work uh, uh, workers' representatives, and they had the right to ask some information and withhold their, uh, uh, their, it's not decision, it's consultation, their advice. Uh, but uh, uh, this now is uh, in a framework, in a time framework, uh, two, three or four months, depend, uh, how, how, uh, how, uh, depends on the various cases. So it is very uh, predictable as well. Uh, you are not stuck in a, in a process where the consultation is not made. These are the real uh, two uh, game changers. So maybe I can uh, go through the um, presentation now, or, or do, you, do you like to ask another question? I have actually another question uh, for you, Mr. Tese. In terms of uh, uh, corporate uh, uh, law, 
uh, more generally, uh, which is yeah. also your specialty. Uh, maybe yeah. some novelty there also as you know, game changer as well. What would be the position of France in terms of its competitiveness and advantages for its companies vis-a-vis -vis other you know, countries you know, from Europe? Yes, so here I would like to um, uh, uh, explain you, uh, well, it's, it's a good transition because this is one point I wanted to, to show in the presentation. France is really a good location for holdings uh, company uh, for uh, uh, three reasons. And one of them is a flexible corporate law, which I, which I show here. Um, uh, why? Uh, actually, we have. Uh, it's not. It's, it's not recent, but uh, uh, since uh, 1994, we have a new form of company which is called SAS, Simplified uh, Stock Company, uh, and this you can define the governance as you as you like. Uh, the only restraint, basically, is that you need to have uh, one president. So you define it contractually, and a thing which is never uh, rarely spoken about is if you compare it with countries like uh, Belgium or, or, or Netherlands or most uh, European countries, uh, you have, uh, it's more difficult to, to set up a company because you, you have uh, uh, notaries uh, which needs to be in the process. So you have to, to get a, a notarial uh, uh, deal uh, and this uh, uh, makes the process a little bit more heavy. Um, in Belgium, for example, you also need to, 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 to make a business plan uh, before uh, uh, start uh, setting up your company. I don't say it's a bad thing, but officially, uh, well, uh, you have a kind of official business plan and in most of the cases it's not uh, necessary. So, um, uh, France is really uh, flexible on that. Just uh, uh, something which is um, uh, recent uh, is that uh, for, small si for, for small uh, companies, uh, uh, various simplification measures have been taken in uh, 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 2019. Uh, just to give you an example, it's uh, no longer necessary to have a statutory auditor uh, unless you reach a certain uh, threshold. Uh, you can have companies with uh, 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 no minimum capital. Actually, uh, I we recommend to have a uh, some minimum capital, uh, of, uh, but it can be as little as 1,000 euro, for example. Uh, many, many uh, little things which make it, uh, which, which make life easier. And basically, you can have a, a, a company uh, set up in uh, uh, less than one week. Um, I would say at present, the, the most uh, the, the thing to, to take care of is uh, uh, to get the certificate from the bank that the capital is, uh, is paid. And this may take a little bit of time due to uh, KYC uh, matter. That's my. Thank you, uh, Mr. Teze. Uh, and indeed, you're right. You know, you mentioned something very important about banking, and we will have, you know, question, you know, uh, 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 you know, later on uh, on on this aspect as well. Uh, I, I would also like to uh, give the floor now, you know, again, you know, to Nicola, uh, Nicola Rivoli, uh, and you know, I, I would like to understand also, you know, uh, uh, in terms of establishment, if an Indian company chooses, you know, to you know, the MA routes to establish itself in France to, to expand in Europe. What is the state of this sector in France and what are the reasons for a foreign company to favor this route? Thank you, uh, Divine. Um, yes, um, doing uh, mergers and acquisitions, um, doing acquisitions in, um, in France, I think it's a it's a way of investing that uh, that could be attractive for um, for a number of Indian group. Um, of course, what it brings um, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of advantage is um, going through the acquisition route um, is um, usually more quicker is usually quicker than uh, than uh, going through a, a greenfield uh, project. Um, so. Uh, I think that's um, that's something that can be uh, that can be considered um, for Indian companies that want to uh, to develop, um, in particular in Europe, or to use France as a basis for developing on a, uh, other international markets like um, like Africa. Doing an acquisition of a company that is already established in France may be a good accelerator for uh, for growth. 
Uh, of course, that has to be reviewed as any uh, m and project as part of an overall strategy um, in terms of diversification, economy of scales, all the advantages that you can get with uh, uh, with acquisition. I think that's a, a strategic tool to uh, um, to achieve growth on a specific uh, specific market. Um, the other thing that can be considered is um, the things that you can find in the in the target company and in particular synergies. Um, synergy achieving synergies is usually uh, what you're looking for when you're when you're doing an acquisition. Um, and that there's always a question and that that would vary uh, depending on the on the sector or the type of company, but you can share resources. You can increase uh, the uh, the efficiency and the effectiveness. Of, uh, of a company or a group by doing an acquisition. Uh, what is very important um, in France, but as uh, everywhere, is the integration plan and uh, monitoring the, the synergies and really uh, delivering the, uh, the synergies. I think it's, uh, it's relatively, uh, relatively uh, easy to find, uh, to find an attractive uh, target in, uh, in, in many, many sectors for, uh, for Indian companies. Um, and uh, to uh, to really benefit from uh, uh, from from added competitive advantages. Of course, when coming from India, there's always a question about uh, um, the fact that you don't want to the companies don't want to dilute their uh, their profitability or their prospect for growth. But I think they can find a number of advantages in terms of growth, uh, in terms of expertise that they may find and they. Uh, they mix with their existing expertise in India in uh, in French uh, in French companies. So going through the acquisition route is definitely something that uh, that has to be considered. And um, also you can use the uh, uh, existing management in place. So um, so that's definitely uh, uh, I think an added advantage as compared to a greenfield project where you have to hire. Uh, new teams or to send uh, on expatriates. Um, having an existing base has a lot of, uh, of advantages. I mean, as long as you're monitoring very well the, uh, the integration, and that's something that is uh, very important to keep in mind as well. Thank you, Nicolas. And uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, you know, we now that you know we have you know a better idea of business setup environment. There are other you know a bunch of very practical questions, and we hear about you know finance and banking you know uh, uh, previously. Uh, for that chapter, we have two panelists with us today uh, who can give us great insights. You know, and I think about you know uh, Sebastian. Uh, uh, Sebastian, you are from a, a prominent bank. Uh, HSBC dealing with MNCs and cross borders operations. Uh, suppose you know you are welcoming at your office today an Indian corporate which need to open a bank account to obviously start operating in France. How, how hard or how easy the process is, and what would be your tips uh, to make it in a record time? Thank you, Ludivine. Uh, in fact, setting up a a bank account is not extremely complicated now in France, but there is uh, something to know that it is existing in a few countries, uh, is, and especially in France, is called the formation of the capital account. So when you open a bank account, you have actually two steps. You have one step uh, with the opening of a capital account to incorporate in order to incorporate your company. And the second step is really the opening of the operational account, the current account. Um, the first step, so the opening of capital account, is something that exists in France and a couple of countries in, in Europe. Um, the, 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 the aim of that capital account is to enable a company to put money on a blocked account uh, and then to uh, get their certificate of incorporation or CABIS, uh, as we know in, in, in France. There are two ways of uh, getting that. Uh, the, if the company wants to go very fast, my recommendation is not to go through the bank, but to go through a notary if you have a physical presence on the ground, because usually it can go uh, quicker. If you have no presence on the ground, uh, and this is what we see for many clients that want a fully digital uh, no presence uh, because a very new or greenfield project, 
you can ask the bank to open the, to open a capital account and you need to provide a set of documentation that is usually quite easy to uh, to get it's uh, more or less the identification of the signatories the, the directors um, and and uh, a couple of documents to ensure that we create a real structure uh, and and this is an important process because it's a legal process it's not a really finance uh, a bank process but it's also a legal process so we need to make sure that every document is really uh, signed off uh, so this is the first step so either go through a notary if, if you have a physical presence and you are in a hurry or you can go through the bank and this could this could be fully digital and fully um, remote if, if need be and then the second step is the real opening of the current account so if you opened the capital account with the same bank, it is easier because we the bank has already collected a certain number of, of uh, documents. Um, the second step is more for the bank to understand how the uh, account will uh, work, uh, practically speaking, the flows, the nature of flows, who will sign, who will operate the accounts, um, the ultimate beneficial owner of the company, and to give a an, an, you know, magnitude of time, we can open an account in a you know, couple of days if everything's fine. Uh, usually, uh, you know, the average time I see is between two weeks and four weeks because we need to ask sometimes uh, additional documentation de depending on, on um, how complex is uh, the setup of the Indian group. So, it really relies on um, the complexity of, uh, of the Indian group going to France, if this is Greenfield or if this is an acquisition, just to make sure that everyone is uh, really, um, uh, really in good order. So that can be quite quick. And to be honest, uh, what we see is that we can now open accounts fully digitally, fully remotely in record time. And this is the, the advice I would I would uh, give to to Indian company who wants to set up greenfield operation is uh, if you bank especially with HSBC uh, in India because HSBC is very strong in India and in France um, if we know your company in India then opening an account in France is much quicker uh, because we have already a certain number of documentation so it can be extremely fast uh, a couple of days a couple of weeks uh, and it's pretty straightforward. Thank you, uh, uh, Sébastien. Uh, uh, and now, you know, my question is for Marianne. Uh, you know, her, Marianne, you know, her, you are from BPE and BPI. Uh, so can you tell us much more uh, what is the mission of BPI, what kind of financing through your organization Indian companies setting up in France can pretend to, because it's beyond banking there, you know, it's really finance. So please, Marianne. Sure. Thank you very much, Ludivine. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, yes, in a nutshell, BPI France is actually a strong tool of the French state to support French economy and French companies. It is fully owned by the French state and it gathers all at once the French sovereign funds, the French Development Bank for SMEs and mid-caps, and also the French Export Credit Agency. And we have two main transverse focuses that are innovation and internationalization. And so the, the main question is for an Indian company or an Indian group that is interested in investing in France is what is the definition of a French company for us? Uh, it's actually quite wide. Actually, the, our definition of a French company is a company that is registered in France, established in France, but has an activity in France. But even a company that is owned, fully owned, by a, a, an Indian company, an international group uh, is eligible to our support. And it can also be a company that has recently uh, been acquired by uh, an international interest. So that's not, a, that's not a, an obstacle. But uh, what is interesting to, to have in mind and keep in mind, I think I will have the opportunity to go more into details about what we can offer as far as, uh, as, far as innovation, industrialization is concerned. And uh, what we have to keep in mind is that for non-equity uh, solution that we have, we do have a selling uh, in the size of the company, in the consolidated size of the company, so that is usually the mid-cap size, meaning 5,000 uh, employees 
and 1.5 billion of turnover. All right, thank you, Marianne, for that. And thank you both, actually, for throwing light, you know, around the banking and finance perspective in France for an Indian companies who like to set up there. Uh, but, you know, uh, we, we, can't, we can't be complete before solving the aspect around immigration and talents. So now uh, I would like to ask Rohan uh, from Expat Partners, well, if you are an Indian company which would like to set up in France, what kind of difficulties would you face mobility-wise? Thank you, uh, Ludivin. Um, good afternoon, everybody. For the purpose of this, uh, we are doing a case study just to give you all an understanding of how things work from an immigration perspective. So for the purpose of this case study, I am the CEO of Belek, a company that manufactures and sells electric bicycles. And these bicycles are made 90% of recycled materials. We are looking at starting selling our bicycles in the quarter coming up in the coming year. Is there any way we can achieve this, Fiona? Well, actually, Rowan, um, thank you very much for the question. And there are quite a few solutions that I would like um, to go through with you. Uh, France has set up the most incredible immigration uh, category, which is called Talent Passport, which is very unique in Europe and has 11 different categories. Here for you, we're just going to present four to begin with um, as an entrepreneur or an investor. Uh, we've got a Talent Passport investor, creation of a company, a legal representative, or if you don't use the Talent Passport and you could use also an entrepreneur visa as well. So, Ron, let's start off with the Talent Passport Investor, because this um, would definitely be one, especially for those who are going to be acquiring, which may be your case for Belek. Maybe you're going to be acquiring something in Lille or in that area for your manufacturing. So the conditions are very easy. There are only three main ones, and this is going to be individuals or a company who are investing personally you've got to actually agree and commit that you will be safeguarding or creating uh, employment uh, for the first four years, and you have a minimum investment of 300,000. So for investors, I think this is a really good solution. Fiona, I'd like to stop you there. And I don't think the investor visa is actually the right visa for me. Is there any other option that I oh. might use? Oh, definitely, Rowan. If you if you don't want to make the investment of the three hundred thousand, you could also look at the talent passport creation of a company, uh, where the investment is much lower because it's thirty thousand euros. Uh, you do have to justify under all these categories, of course, that you've got a serious project, so it's going to be a business plan. Uh, we're very clear about that. Five to ten pages is really largely sufficient, but it should also have a financial projection of three years. Uh, we're always going to say, please turn to a French accountant to help you with that. And the person who is applying, who is investing, because this is a personal application, should show a diploma, master degree level, or five years of professional experience. This is pretty interesting, but is there anything else I can look at, Fiona? So, Ron, let's say that you actually decide that you're going to set up an affiliate of your Indian entity here in France. Um, again, we're still up in Lille on that area. And you yourself, because you're the CEO of your Indian entity, you're going to be transferring to France. So here you could actually have a talent passport legal representative. Um, you have, and I know that you can show this, that you've got your three months um, in your position as such. And the other main requirement is that you're going to have to have a compensation to meet this minimum requirement that's showing on the slide of 55 or let's say 56,000 euros. So that is a very good solution. And here you would not be required to show a business plan as such. Yes, you of course, the French authorities are going to look into the seriousness of the project and that your company in India is well established as well. 
Now, Ron, I also want to just very, very briefly, because I know that you don't want to probably look at what we call the entrepreneur visa, because you're, you are setting up an actual unit uh, to make your Belek bicycle. But this does exist, and I think it's important for the audience also to know that you could also go for an entrepreneur visa sure. if you didn't enter the other categories. Um, as you can see, it's quite simple. The main idea here is that you must be able to show the seriousness of your project. One point that I didn't mention at the beginning is that the Talent Passport offers the wonderful solution of having a four-year permit, so that you don't have to go through extensions. And also, for those who are married, Rowan, this could be your case, your wife would be able to work in France through a Talent Passport family category. Listening to you, Fiona, it looks to me that the Talent Passport legal representative would probably suit me the best. I think However, so. my next question comes into mind. It's not only me that needs to be in France. I have a managing director uh, who needs to be there for 12 months, and I have about around 20 or experts that we need. And I, I insist, Fiona, that is, it is going to be a growing team. So how do I handle things for this team? And how soon can we have them there? How difficult it is, is it going to be to obtain documents for them? Can you throw some light on this, please? Oui, there. Most definitely, Rowan. Um, so bravo, again, hein? again, um, I do think that France offers a lot here because ça a, a valu tout le stress que tu t'es donné. We've got yeah. talent passport. I think there's somebody who's got an open mic. Uh, yeah, so sorry for the confusion. Okay, super. So here, Ron, you've actually got a lot of solutions again. Um, for intracompany transfers, there are two main categories. You've got a talent passport employee on assignment, or you've got an ICT detachment. So for your managing director, probably you're going to use an ICT detachment because he's here for 12 months. But we would need to see what is fully his role. You've got to assess the person's role, but those would be the two solutions for him. Then for your experts, again, assessment is going to be very essential. How long are they coming in for? The ICT detachment is for three years maximum. The talent passport employee on assignment is four years and can be extended. Or you could hire the person under a Talent Passport European Blue Card, which is a super category. And then you have something which is very unique in France, which is short-term assignments for experts. So I know that probably most of your people that you're going to be transferring could fall into an IT expert category. We need to assess that, of course. And if that was the case, they would not require for a short term assignment a work permit. They would need their visa. They would have to have a posted worker um, declaration. And yes, because we are not yet into a full bilateral bilateral agreement between India and France on social security, they would have to have French social security except for their retirement fund, providing they have the certificate on the Provident Fund um, from that. Now, how difficult is it is? That I know this is what you Before really want that, to know. Before that, Fiona, can you just define for us what is a short term and what is a long term? Of course, that is always a question. Thank you for asking it, Rowan. So short term, and this is Schengen rulings for everybody, is 90 days during a rolling period of 180 days. And that includes all travel into the Schengen states. So Rowan, your IT engineers, because I know that you've got projects in Germany, you're going to have to count the days they've spent in Germany to be careful that they don't overstay. OK? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fiona and Juan. I'm sorry, but we are constrained by the time. 
uh, I think you know we have a fantastic you know uh, 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 picture uh, of the of the situation and how you know we have you know uh, different options uh, uh, to prepare you know for for transferring and I, I I will invite you know our audience you know to ask you questions and you know to be also uh, in relationship offline you know uh, uh, with you guys you know about those you know very interesting uh, uh, subjects now. Um, it's time to leave the floor, you know, for you know, to our regional partner, North France Region, North France Invest, and I would like to introduce to our audience Mr. Arthur Gallet, Director United Kingdom Ireland at North France Invest, to present us the key competitive advantages of his region, along with Mr. Yvan Gomel, Head Business Development of Port of Dunkirk to brief us about the logistic ecosystem in the region. Uh, and over to you, Artus. Thank you very much, uh, Ludivine. So let me just share my slides quickly. Okay. Uh, can you see them now? Yeah. Is it fine? Okay, can you see them? Is it fine for everyone? Absolutely. OK, oui. perfect. Many thanks. Um, so well, thanks. Thanks a lot to your business sponsor, India, uh, Eric okay, Kachika sure. and uh, Ludivine for inviting us to uh, take part in this webinar and for organizing this uh, this webinar. Um, it's a great pleasure for me well, professionally to uh, take part in this webinar, but also on a personal level. Um, as it happens, I was actually born in India, uh, in uh, Oroville, uh, near uh, Pondicherry in, uh, in Tamil Nadu, and my second name is uh, Balarama. So uh, those who wish can call me Balarama uh, today during our discussion. Um, so as you said, I am the uh, Order France representative to the UK and director for the UK and Ireland at uh, Nord France Invest, which is the investment promotion agency for the Eau de France region, which is basically the region going from the north of Paris all the way up to Calais and, and Dunkirk. So the reason why we were interested to take part in this webinar is because, uh, I mean, I'm coordinating all our strategy in relation to the United Kingdom and trying to encourage uh, UK and international companies based in the UK to, uh, to invest in our region and to use the Eau de France region as their gateway to, to, to Europe. And for obvious linguistic and historical reasons, many Indian companies go through the UK in order to access European markets. And that's, that's been the case for, for, for decades now. Obviously, the problem now is that Brexit happened uh, finally after five years of, uh, of debates and negotiation. And so uh, since this happened, Obviously, Indian companies find themselves in a probably difficult situation uh, trying to access European markets going through the UK. And so our argument, and this is really my main message for you today, is that you can use the Eau de France region as the ideal link, allowing you to have one foot in the European single market and still having proximity uh, to, uh, to the UK. So going in, in more detail, so what concretely happened uh, with Brexit? Well, two things. The first one is that the United Kingdom left the European single market, and this has uh, a strong number of uh, consequences. First of all, in terms of the trade in goods, now you have different standards applying. So for goods that used to be marked CE, so the European uh, uh, Conformity Assessment, uh, goods produced in the UK will now have a different la label called UKCA, for now, most rules are relatively similar because the, U the UK just exited the EU, but over the uh, medium term and over the long term, these rules, it's very likely that these rules will start to, to diverge. So you have two different markets with different sets of certifications for goods. In terms of services, this is also affected because you have, you've had the end of regulatory equivalence uh, with Brexit. So that means that, for example, an Indian bank based in the UK can no longer use that base to distribute its services to European clients across Europe. It would now have to have a legal entity in Europe in order to be able to, to do so. In terms of trading animals and products of animal or vegetable origins, the big difference here is that you have sanitary and phytosanitary controls at the border. And here is literally everything. So whether it's uh, sandwiches, whether it's live animals, horses, whether it's uh, uh, any kind of plant, they, they are being checked uh, at the border. And that's really enshrined in, in European rules. Another element is rules of origin. So basically the 
agreement removes tariff barriers, but only for goods that were made in the UK or made in the EU. And for that, Europe, uh, the, the companies actually exporting need to prove the origins of goods. And if the, good, if the goods being exported are neither British nor European, then they will uh, incur tariffs. VAT is also an important issue because, uh, I mean, for UK exports to the EU, you need a VAT number in one of the uh, European countries in order to avoid complications. And I'll come to that later. Another important element is that the UK also left the customs union or the European customs union. Uh, so that means that anyone exporting between the UK and the EU has to follow customs constraints uh, such as export declarations, import declarations, and also uh, undergo controls at the border. These controls are not systematic, uh, but you do have sort of uh, customs procedures to follow that are very precise. So the bottom line now is that since Brexit, it's become very complicated to uh, to sell from the UK into uh, into the EU. The fact that it's complicated doesn't mean that it's impossible. It just means that it needs to be made much more professional. And I mean, to summarize, it's become very complex to sell B2C from the UK to Europe. So the solutions that we tend to put forward for many companies is to reorganize their supply chain so that the flow from the UK to Europe is B2B, so to, to, to their own company in, in Europe or to a business partner in, in Europe and, for example, in the Eau de France region. Now, focusing more on the trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the EU, you may have followed that, but after years of uh, debates and negotiation, the UK and EU agreed on a free trade agreement in uh, December uh, 2020. So the positive side thing really is that we avoided a hard Brexit, so a so-called hard Brexit, so uh, a radical exit of the UK from the EU without anything uh, to sort of uh, smooth flows and trade afterwards. The problem here is that the trade and cooperation agreement uh, is, is really minimalist. It's, ju it's just about removing tariffs on the trading goods, but it doesn't cover uh, services. The, the other problem is that it's relatively imbalanced because of the relative weight of the UK and European uh, economies. Obviously, the impact is likely to be felt more on the UK side than on the European side. And finally, this agreement is relatively unstable uh, for a very simple reason. Uh, it's the agreement is very flexible. If one side is unhappy about one specific topic, it can retaliate in different sectors. So this just, this just shows the intensity of the, of the final negotiations and the fact that both sides wanted to be able to, to, to find solutions to act if they were unhappy about a specific situation. So it's great that it's flexible, but the, the problem is that if Whatever happens, if you have a crisis around fish, as you may have seen it uh, recently, around the Northern Ireland Protocol or around the migrants crisis, for example, any source of instability can quickly lead to a trade war with one side saying, I'm not happy about the fish uh, situation, so I'm going to retaliate on car exports, for example, or on another sector. So, so far, the agreement has been continuing, but its uh, its governance is relatively unstable. So. What does it mean concretely for uh, for yourself, so for Indian companies that are operating between the UK and the EU? Uh, as I said, I mean, it's become very complex uh, for an Indian company, for example, to export from the India to the UK and then from the UK to uh, the EU, uh, because basically in, in that case, you would have to undergo uh, sanitary and phytosanitary controls, uh, if applicable, and uh, customs procedures twice, once from the India from India to the UK and once from the UK to uh, to, 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 to the EU. Um, rules of origin, as, as I mentioned, uh, is, a, is another issue for US companies exporting. As uh, as I said, I mean, uh, if you go through the uh, through the, the UK, even if you do have some transformation of products in the UK, the problem is um, the, trans the transformations performed to goods that are being exported uh, to the EU need to be substantial uh, in, in the UK in order for these goods to actually be labeled made in UK. So bottom line, if uh, you're an Indian company, you export your goods uh, to the UK, you just repackage them and then export them to the EU. It will not be considered as goods made in the UK and therefore you will have tariffs that apply. Uh, well, obviously tariffs vary depending on the actual goods uh, concerned. And in terms of services, uh, as I mentioned, it's also 
uh, an important issue for you if you were distributing some services from the UK to uh, to the EU. So the bottom line here really is uh, if you want to uh, simplify and preserve your uh, access to European markets, the easiest solution really is to create your own company, for example, in the Eau de France region, uh, which I have the pleasure to to represent uh, in, uh, in in the UK. Um, so this is the map of our region. Um, so as you can see, it's, it's really central. I mean, as the uh, French ambassador has said, uh, it's right next to the UK. It's really the closest point in Europe to the UK, and it's really close to, uh, to to Belgium, to the Netherlands, to Luxembourg, and to and to Paris. So bottom line, if you look, if you take a 300 kilometer radius around Lille, the regional capital, you have 78 million people with annual purchasing power of 1.5 trillion euros so it's really central in terms of market access but at the same time you can have you can have accessible costs so real estate and hr hr costs which are much less than say in in paris or in uh, or in london um so it's really a region with international uh, appeal i mean what 10 percent of uh, jobs in our region are related to foreign owned companies and we'll hear some of them in in the round table afterwards and this proportion increases to close to 40 percent for jobs in industry so we're really open to business open to international companies indian companies who want to do business with us we're really happy to talk on any sort of projects with uh, with with all of you and in fact 85 percent of the companies who are already in our region uh, do recommend uh, the region for business in terms of skills and and uh, well, developing uh, uh, well the, the, our, our center of excellence overall, uh, as you can see, we have uh, close to 10% of uh, the uh, overall number of uh, students in France and uh, more than 10% of French engineers that are being trained here in our close to 40 specialized institutions and, and universities. So these are some of the questions that you may be asking yourselves as Indian businesses. How much does it cost for me to set up uh, in, in France, in Europe, elsewhere? And you've heard all the detailed information uh, from all the uh, highly qualified experts in this webinar. So I won't go through that in, in more detail. I just want to give you a few numbers. If you were to set up uh, an office in Lille, for example, the regional capital uh, for about 10 people, whatever the, the business, whether you're a fintech company, whether you're sort of an, an, an industrial company, whether you're in agriculture, car manufacturing, you name it, it would basically cost you around half a million euros uh, annually. If you want to set up a customer service center, as some companies may want to, uh, especially in terms of uh, uh, providing uh, services to the customer base for, uh, for, for example, if you're a, a finance or a banking institution, that would cost you around 1.5 million euros annually. And that's for a team of around 50 people in Arras, so about 40 minutes uh, by train from, from Lille. Research tax credit, uh, it's been mentioned before, very uh, useful and uh, incredibly helpful in terms of developing your uh, skills and engineering and uh, uh, technological base. Recruitment is always a key issue uh, for all companies, really. So uh, I just wanted to highlight a few companies who have managed to uh, deal with the recruitment challenge. Uh, I'll only name one. You have the other ones on this side. I mean, Booking.com, they've basically opened a customer service center in Tourcoing, which is a city very close to Lille, uh, with close to 750 employees. Uh, and they, they were from 43 different nationalities speaking up to 28 uh, languages. So it really shows the scale of uh, skills and talent that you can find locally. That's it from me. Uh, here are my contact details, but obviously I'll be happy to answer any of your questions either now or uh, later on, uh, on on a one to one basis. And now I believe it's on to uh, Yves Argomel uh, and the port of Dunkirk, which is a truly great port in, in our region. Thank you, Artus. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh I think you know, we might have you know, a problem of connection with Mr. Gomel. Um, hi, I have a question. Can I ask now or would you want to ask later? Uh, please, if you if you can, you know, uh, maybe you know, um, uh, uh, list your, your question in the chat box 
and uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to make sure, you know, to, uh, um, to ask the question at the end of the session. So, est-ce que le board de Dunkerque est en ligne? Monsieur Gomel? Bon, je pense que vous pouvez passer à... Uh, oui. Ah, ça y est. Yes. I'm, back. I'm very sorry, I just had a, a technical issue. Um, I don't know if uh, Antika can share my presentation, please. Yes, I'm doing that right away. Okay, thank you very much. Can you see it? Can you see it? Just one minute. Uh, okay, thank you. Allez-y, commencez pendant que un chica. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, um, what I'm gonna uh, try to do is to make a short presentation about the port of Dunkirk, where we are, and uh, what we are doing. So, the first slide that you will see shortly, um, uh, as Arthur said, Dunkirk is located in uh, north of France. Uh, we are about a uh, 275 k's uh, to Paris, um, 150 k's to Brussels, and we are by track, let's say through the channel tunnel or through the short sea services that we have in Dunkirk, about two hours and a half, uh, two hours and a half uh, to London. Okay, I can see that. So maybe you can pass to the next slide, please. No. Okay, this is it. You have already seen some. Um, this slide, but just to explain to you that when you look at the geographical situation of the port of Dunkirk, we are not only a French port for French cargo, which is coming in or out, but uh, uh, we act as well as uh, uh, EU distribution centers for the surrounding country. Uh, and UK, uh, post Brexit, uh, became, became even closer. And uh, I will explain to you what we have been doing in order to facilitate uh, the people who decide to relocate it. Uh, the uh, distribution center and to organize a supply chain and, and uh, warehousing uh, within EU. Uh, Dunkirk uh, with the neighborhood port, uh, this is the map, thank you. Uh, the, you have a view of the port uh, of Dunkirk, it's quite a wide port. Uh, from east uh, uh, to west, you've got about 17 kilometers. Uh, it's standing over 7,000 hectares on the luxury of the port of Dunkirk is a space. Uh, you uh, may know that on the current situation with the congestions uh, in the world and especially in Europe, uh, we are well, we are welcoming new investment because we have land. Over the 7,000 hectares that we do provide, 3,000 hectares are fully dedicated for any kind of development. Can be port uh, development, can be industrial development, and of course warehousing and uh logistic one on this map uh, the port is divided on the two main parts the eastern part which is a traditional activities with a well-known company from india called uh, uh, arcelor metal and we've got a, uh, and the western port is everything which is linked to uh, the containers activities the rural activities and all the investment both in industry and logistic next please Okay, uh, just a few words, uh, technically speaking, about uh, the uh, container terminal. Uh, Dunkirk is going to uh, uh, quite a large container terminal. I'm not going to bother you too much with technical information, but basically we can receive all the size of vessel in the world. You saw the first slide, uh, uh, vessel coming from Far East as the biggest one. Uh, to give you an idea, the capacity of those one is 24,000 to use. Uh, the container terminal is run privately, and there is something that I need to to explain uh, again. I will say that um, the social organizations that the Port of Dunkirk has, um, I know that sometimes uh, uh, strikes is a second sport in France, but Dunkirk Port uh, did not face any single minute of strikes for the past uh, 29 years. 
only due to the fact that Doc Lebu uh, uh, 30 years ago realized that uh, we have a big neighbor called uh, Rotterdam and Antwerp, and uh, it was much better to get a 50% of something than 100 of nothing. So the National Union, which is well known in French, is not acting uh, in Dunkerque. Going, so the next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, in terms of containers, which is uh, uh, probably the, the main activity which is growing now, uh, even if we have much smaller than Rotterdam and Antwerp, as an example, but the increase over the past 10 years has been uh, uh, quite impressive. And to already give you some figure about uh, 2021, uh, we should have an increase of plus 42% increase. And part of it is going to be transshipment and transshipment to the UK and transshipment to Republic of Ireland and the other uh, uh, neighborhood uh, countries. The next one, please. Uh, of course, uh, to do so, uh, Dunkirk port is acting as a deep sea port. Uh, as a lot of ports in the north of Europe, we've got a cert certain numbers of links. The main one, and this is not a, a surprise, is the one coming from Far East. Uh, CMA CGM together with our double CL Costco Evergreen uh, as running uh, one to uh, two services per week uh, from Far East to Dunkirk. Uh, Middle East and India, of course, uh, is uh, one of the uh, uh, important line too. And the third part, uh, which is uh, for the past 10 years has been growing a lot, uh, is a line going to Latin America and to uh, South America, uh, very much linked to the reefer cargo. Uh, because Dunkirk is one of the uh, leading ports in Europe for uh, food industry, whatever we are talking about, uh, uh, meat, uh, dairy, fried fish, fruit and veggie. Next one, please. Uh, but what is uh, important today is definitely what we have been working over the past 15 years. Uh, uh, as we were talking uh, a little bit uh, in advance before, um, Dunkirk uh, is on the way to uh, to be a port green. Uh, we are working a lot on the de decarbonization, and we try uh, to develop train, barge, and short sea services. Uh, Dunkirk, as I said at the very beginning, it's acting a lot on its close internet, but we have been developing a certain number of links. I will talk a bit later, a link to the Brexit, what we have been doing between uh, uh, Dunkirk and UK and Ireland, but we are. Uh, uh, Delivering now uh, south of Europe, especially Spain and Portugal, we are acting a lot in North of Africa. Uh, it's not a part of Europe, but it's only a uh, five days transit time. And of course, uh, UK has we have been working a lot how to uh, avoid any trouble uh, after Brexit to deliver UK and to deliver uh, Republic. So that's going to be the next one, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, as to say, we have been working a lot uh, in Dunkirk with the custom, with a FITO and a VET uh, office uh, to be Brexit ready. Uh, and uh, finally, and we uh, succeed to be the, the fifth uh, English port. We have been always uh, training with United Kingdom. It has been more than 20, 25 years uh, that we have a line back and forward in Roro for trucks and drop trailers on the way to Dover. Maybe we can pass to the next slide. Please. Yes. Uh, no, the one before. Thank you. Uh, the FDSC, which is a Danish company, uh, has been running, as I say, for more than 25 years uh, with one call every two hours on the way to Dover. Uh, to be honest, since the Brexit, uh, uh, the volume that we have been uh, loading on this vessel decreased a bit. We usually did um, Roughly speaking, 750,000 trucks uh, per year to UK. Now it's dropped down a little bit uh, to uh, 620,000 uh, trucks uh, this year. But still, uh, the land bridge uh, to the UK it's uh, uh, is still a solution. Uh, Art Artus explained when well, uh, the the problems that uh, the new exporters uh, from Europe or the people uh, who want to export to Europe as to face when we are talking about. Uh, uh, custom uh, vet and fito. Uh, but what we have been doing uh, to find a new solution, the next one, as an example, uh, we uh, start on the 2nd of January, a new direct service uh, between Dunkirk and the Republic of Ireland, 
which is working uh, quite well for the people who needed absolutely or wanted to avoid the land bridge. And today um, we've got a service uh, from the FDS as well too, to the port, to the Irish port of uh, Rosla, and it will carry around 50,000 trucks uh, by the end of this year. And uh, we plan to pass from uh, six call per week to, to eight call uh, within a couple of months. Uh, Roro has been an option uh, for the people who want it, but before the Brexit, we already start container service, which it was brand new for us to Highland uh, once again, because we had two ways for the I mean, people are two ways to avoid the, the, the problem of the Brexit. First of all, to have a direct route uh, in Roro. Uh, first of all, uh, to be Brexit ready if you wanted to use the land bridge and to change the way of transport and containers uh, to UK and containers to Ireland has been increasing a lot. And this is an example of uh, one weekly service which is running from Dakar to Dublin and Cork. The next one. Yes, on top of uh, that, still in containers, uh, Dunkerque uh, uh, used to have only short services to English port uh, for uh, intra-European traffic. Uh, since the, brink, the Brexit, we are acting as a transshipment hub. It does mean we receive a lot of more vessels coming from Far East, coming from India or coming from uh, South America. And uh, there is a bench of a small vessel called Feeder who are calling on a weekly uh, weekly basis, support of uh, Liverpool, Bristol, T-Sports, Greenhook, uh, and so on. So that means we diversify the way of transporting the cargo uh, to the UK. The next one, please. Uh, as soon as you have the geographical situation, as soon as you have land and maritime links, uh, which is growing a lot now in Dunkerque is the recent investment for industry and for warehousing. Uh, to cope with this demand, uh, the port of Dunkerque has been uh, developing in terms of warehousing an area 150 hectares. Uh, plug and play, that means uh, we had already the authorization for archaeological, uh, environmental, uh, was low. Uh, now, any kind of investor who want to have his distribution centers uh, in the Hauts de France and especially close to the waters uh, can come and we lease the land and he just need to obtain his building permit. It was done to speed up the process and avoiding all the administration permit which sometimes it can take up to two years before you start to build. Today, uh, this area is almost full we will develop a new one, same size, uh, either by shippers and receivers who want to have their own facilities uh, bonded uh, for their own production, or 3PL and 4PL logistician company who want to invest directly for their client. And we do have, as well, real estate company who are ready, eager to share the risk, the risk with the industrial company by investing in warehouse in gray means having the build, building permit but not already set up or in white uh, without uh, having any that means today as an example we start the work of a 47,000 uh, square meter warehouse for dry and chill cargo uh, will be ready within 10 months that means if somebody need to have quickly uh, space close to the waters it can be done uh, by the end of next year Nevertheless, this is what we are doing in order to increase the capacity of the uh, distribution center uh, in Dunkerque for short sea and deep sea. But we do have already a certain numbers of logistic companies for frost, fresh or dry cargo, acting for deep sea cargo. And we, as we have been always do, uh, because it's not the first time that we, uh, we have warehouse to distribute the United Kingdom, but it's true that now the bigger demand uh, is for the uh, English logistician company who asking us a solution in order to organize to EU cargo coming from Far East, cargo coming from India. I, next slide, please. 
uh, that you have a view maybe, of, maybe uh, if, if, if we can wrap up in uh, in one or two minutes if possible I'm yeah okay so that's going to be my uh, my last slide so just to have a view that uh, uh, on uh, on the US port on the green part uh, there is an area called DLI Dunkirk Logistics International it's where today uh, we are welcoming uh, uh, all the warehouse they are nearby nearby the container terminal which is on the on the left side uh, and on uh, on the north side, you've got both the Irish terminal and uh, the UK one. So, if you have any any wish, if you want to uh, carry on any study about uh, having your own or leasing uh, some facilities in Dunkirk, uh, we will pass you my whereabouts, and uh, do not hesitate to to contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvon. Yvon. Please, uh, uh, Artus, you know, now, you know, we have, uh, uh, you know, another roundtable with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, panelists, you know, uh, companies, Indian companies who successfully, you know, set up in, in France. This, uh, this roundtable will be uh, moderated by you, Artus, so I hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Judivine. Hello again, everyone. So uh, we have about 25 minutes to talk about four uh, very uh, nice internationally uh, minded and uh, high tech companies who have invested in France uh, and who are going to tell us about uh, why they chose France and why did they decided to stay and what they're, they're doing there. Um, we will begin first with uh, Aurobindo and we're with Mr. Sanjeev Dani. So the way I will do this is I will ask each uh, presenter to present uh, their own company, what they do, and uh, list some of the key reasons uh, why they, they like being in France. And obviously this needs to be as interactive as possible. So I will ask all the other uh, presenters to feel free to, to chip in with any questions, remark, or anything they want to say as the, as the discussion uh, progresses. So uh, Sanjeev, please go ahead uh, with your description and I will put up the slide that you, that you sent me. Yeah, thank you, Artis, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as you are aware, Arbindo Pharma Limited is in the top 10 global pharmaceutical uh, operating in generic space. And we find that uh, we, we have achieved considerable success in USA. We are by volume by far the biggest company uh, in generic space. And uh, we think that uh, Europe is the next opportunity and uh, which other market but uh, France to penetrate well. Uh, in fact, uh, Aero France is our wholly owned subsidiary in uh, France based in Lyon. And it is the biggest operation for pharmaceutical uh, uh, countries that we have. Uh, Aero France is the biggest volume supplier of uh, hospital needs in France. And it is the seventh largest company in retail, that is the pharmacist, with almost 7% market share. And we have more than 1,000 products registered, and we have uh, another 250 products getting registered very uh, shortly. We have a full-time employee, 220, and another 100, which are based on outsource, uh, you know, logistics supply provider, Geodis. And as you can see, 250 million euro was the last uh, last year turnover. Uh, why we are in France, and uh, why we are very optimistic about France, is simply because. France is the one of the top uh, uh, economy of Europe. Uh, pharmaceutical wise uh, and the generic acceptance is very good because it saves a lot of healthcare uh, money and the budget for the government. And even the culturally it is accepting uh, those kind of products which are coming from not necessarily manufactured in Europe. However, our 50% of products are manufactured in Europe and 50% are sourced from India and uh, both the pies are growing. Uh, we have recently inaugurated a logistic, fresh new logistic site at St. Wilbas. And uh, this is uh, the pictures of this particular uh, site, which was inaugurated very recently in September. And uh, it, it is having a, a investment of 20 million uh, euro and employing, as I said, more than 100 FTE and uh, we, by and large going to meet the need of the France uh, from this logistics site, but we also hope to supply to some of the uh, other European countries. So that's about uh, Aero France. Uh, thank you very much, Artis. Thank you very much, Sanjeev. So uh, how important is France as a strategic location 
in terms of uh, distributing your products across Europe? Well, actually, you know, because uh, there is a south of France, uh, Marcel is a very good uh, port entry. And from there, uh, we can uh, actually take into this warehouse the stocks and then distribute to the rest of the Europe. That possibility always exists. But as I mentioned, primarily we are going to meet 80 percent of uh, this warehouse capacity for meeting the France market. OK, perfect. And uh, in terms of the local uh, industrial pharma uh, ecosystem, uh, have you developed links with any companies locally and how important has that proved uh, in terms of uh, developing your activities in France? Yeah, that's right. As I said, 50 percent of our volume is sourced from uh, within Europe. And these are all uh, CMO, as we call contract manufacturing organization. They take our technology and then they produce locally in France or even uh, in some of the other European Union uh, states and then supply to us. So I think we have uh, more than 60, con uh, 60 companies who are supplying to Aero France. OK, perfect. And um, do you uh, have any business in the UK or uh, do you intend to uh, use your France basis as a uh, uh, as a way to access uh, the UK market as well? Well, actually, you know, France is the, I mean, biggest business for us in European Union. So we are looking standalone. We think, you know, right now the usage of generics in France is 40%. In US, it is more than 90%. So there is a lot of uh, headroom to grow in France. And we think that actually the Aero France will remain the, you know, head business for European Union for us. And UK, obviously, because we had a head start and we are highly regulated uh, market. I mean, we are a highly regulated industry. We have already separated the regulation wise, the UK business. They cannot theoretically supply from uh, the European Union to UK without going through their checks and control system. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Sanjeev. So the, one of the other companies who uh, also uh, sees as very important to have a strong local ecosystem of, of big companies is, is TCS. Uh, so we have with us uh, Severine uh, Lafourcade, uh, who is present. So uh, Severine, please uh, uh, present uh, TCS to us, uh, what you do where in France uh, and what, what, what you do there. Um, and I will put up the slide that you sent me and then we can uh, go on to the main points for which you're, you're actually in France. Uh, yes, so first of all, uh, thanks Sir Hartus for the introduction and thanks Sir Anshika and Eric uh, for the invitation. I will not present the Tata Group in detail um, because uh, if I do so, I will certainly take uh, all the time of this uh, roundtable due to the, um, the rich history of uh, the Tata Group and, uh, and the size of that company. Uh, what I can say is today TCS or Tata Consultancy Services is the fastest uh, growing brand in the IT and the digital transformation uh, uh, industry. Uh, we are today more than 500,000 people uh, worldwide and uh, we are um, our presence are in France um, started in 1992. And uh, since then, uh, we never looked back. So we, our TCS has made his um, largest uh, investment uh, ever in the history of its operation uh, in France uh, by acquiring a French company uh, in uh, 2012 but also uh, by opening a local delivery center in France. So in Ling, uh, North, uh, North region, uh, as presented by you, uh, Artus, but also in Poitiers, so west, southwest of France. And uh, we also uh, recently expanded our uh, offices and uh, location uh, in Paris region. So uh, what makes um, France attractive for a company like us? Um, the, one of the key points is the talent pool. Uh, it's something which has been mentioned uh, before, but it's real that um, also compare. So it's it's really relative, but compared to other countries uh, in Europe, um, the um, age structure of France uh, makes us a very relative young country. 
I mean, relative because compared to India, there is no, no possible uh, comparison. But um, it's true that uh, we are a relatively young country. And if you combine that with a very good uh, uh, education uh, system and who saw, um, I would say, a culture and appetence for science and technology, um, it's really a good country to invest for a company like us looking for um, engineering uh, expertise. Uh, so that wa was uh, one of the key points. Um, another one uh, is the size of the market. Uh, this has been also mentioned previously, but uh, uh, yes, the, um, France is the second market in Europe but also a market with a large number of global and um, and uh, large company. Uh, if you are looking to the to the Fortune uh, Global 500, uh, who which listed their, uh, the uh, the top 500 company worldwide, France has the higher number. So um, again, um, that's that's the size of of the market is really important. Um, and um, and I, I can also, in addition, mention the infrastructure. Um, we have our center located in region, uh, but finally, our Lille is uh, is very close to Paris as our, uh, as Poitiers. So it's really easy uh, to develop a uh, business. Uh, having uh, offices in Paris or in the region and uh, uh, yeah, travel around uh, France to see customer uh, due to this uh, infrastructure. And also, um, also in Europe, uh, because uh, due to the geographical position of France, we are really in the middle of Europe. So yeah, again, for a company like us, global and uh, very well in, uh, established in Europe, that's make our uh, thinker easy. Thank you very much, Severine. So maybe can you tell us a bit more about your activities in um, in Lille and uh, and what you liked about Lille uh, specifically? So Lille was the first delivery center um, we have uh, launched. Uh, so it's close to ten years ago. Um, we are located uh, in our in our, uh, I can say. Our, uh, a hub which is called uh, Aura Technology, uh, which gets a lot of company and startup uh, working in the technical um, field. So that's creates also a very dynamic uh, ecosystem and environment. Uh, we have um, all right, we have in Lille also a lot of um, uh, main and important company in the retail sector. Um, and uh, and again, a uh, very good uh, talent pool uh, locally, uh, which are, who is really attached to the region, and uh, who are working with us really in their uh, long-term uh, relationship. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, that, that was a question I, I was about to ask b before going on to uh, to uh, Motherson and Eric Ozepi, uh, which is about about talent. So you did manage to find the right talent in in Lille. Right with the uh, with the, with the right skills. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And we all know how important this this question is. So now moving on to uh, Eric Ozepi, who is the CEO at Samvardana Madison Radial Companies. Uh, Eric, so if you want to, if, if you want to present the overall activities uh, of yes. your uh, of your company, and I will put up the slide that you sent me. Yes. Hello, everyone. Yes, Motherson is a well-known automotive Indian capital company, and uh, we have it's about nine billion euro company worldwide with 135,000 employees in, in 41 countries. And actually, Motherson invested in France, started investing in France 12 years ago by uh, two major acquisitions, and we now have uh, six sites in France. Uh, 1,200 employees and 300 million euro. And uh, actually, we have a pretty diversified activity because we have industrial sites, 
Uh, we have an R&D, very important site, in uh, close to Lille, very close to Lille, just like one of our plant is very close to Lille. And we have also a small headquarters because we care about having a slow HGNA, but a small headquarters close to Paris. And all of these actual, uh, all of these activities are in the north half of France, but the two main ones being in Hauts de France. And definitely Hauts de France is a very convenient place because very central, as uh, my colleagues were saying, very central to Europe. And secondly, the northern part of France for many industries like automotive industries and for exporting by road to uh, Europe and to Germany is very well located because of this proximity with Belgium, uh, Netherlands and Germany. So that's all. I don't want to make it too long, uh, but we build actually uh, plastic systems for the automotive industry, interior plastic such as instrument panel that you have in front of you when you drive or door panels. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. So, I mean, as as you said, I mean, as, as we had discussed last time, so the Eau de France is the first car manufacturing region uh, in France and with uh, Renault and uh, Stellantis, which is the uh, new company formed by uh, PSA, so Peugeot uh, and, uh, and and FCA, the, uh, the, well, the Italian uh, car conglomerate, uh, mm -hmm. with in particular two uh, gigafactory projects, which were announced recently, one for Stellantis and one for, for Renault. So, uh, Eric, how important is this sort of a car manufacturing ecosystem, uh, this really this this uh, web of uh, local companies and suppliers locally, how important is it uh, for you to be part of this and therefore uh, as close as possible to your clients? Well, we know this um, industry has a strong future in this region of France because all the traditional combustion engine, which will ramp down regularly in the next, let's say, 15 years, will be replaced by electric mobility. And these companies, Telantis, Renault, Nissan, have made commitment to the electric mobility in this part of, uh, of France. Uh, secondly, we find industrially, by history of this region, a very strong industrial network of suppliers uh, locally and with high capability because not only you have excellent quality blue workers, but you have, and I think my colleague were also saying about it, excellent engineering schools in North France. And many of our engineers in our plants, in our R&D centers are hired through the local engineering uh, schools that we have in uh, Northern, uh, Northern France. So pretty important um, uh, uh, industrial environment. Uh, maybe one thing also in terms of uh, uh, engineering and innovation support is definitely, you talked about it, the uh, credit for research and innovation, which boost research and innovation in France and also based on the quality engineers that we have. So we develop again close to Lille and reinforce our engineering and innovation center and have the let's say, chance to have some economic support of the French government through this credit around innovation. OK, so really on this talent question, you find it. I mean, how did you find it to not just find the right people, but also to keep their skills up to date, as it's obviously an important issue for many industrial companies? Well, it's it's clearly uh, training and training is always a combination of hands on training uh, with your colleague, with your peers, transferring experience. And, and we have a good pyramid of young people that we hire and experience more senior people and systematic uh, policy of, you know, two, three weeks, four weeks training every year for each employee and that we have a multitude of sources for training and, and for development. But yeah, I always insist on coaching from colleagues also to develop your own skills. Perfect. Many thanks, Eric. Now moving on to the fourth uh, company, LTI, and uh, as we move uh, through the discussion, uh, uh, Eric, Sanjeev and Severin, feel free to, to, to speak up, as, as I said. Um, so LTI, uh, which is represented today by Marie-Pierre uh, Civiel. Uh, so Marie-Pierre, as discussed, if you want to start presenting your company and I will put up the slides right now. Uh, 
I don't know whether Marie Pierre can uh, can hear us. You're on mute, Marie. -Pierre. Sorry, I was I was having a yeah, issue with my mic. <laughs> it's okay now. So th first of all, thank you for uh, for uh, inviting us to this session and to to be able to uh, to introduce ourselves also. So. Um, I'm Marie-Pierre Civiel. I'm, I'm the uh, uh, country head for LTI in France and Benelux. Um, LTI is, uh, and, and I represent also the Larsen and Tubo group. So LTI is, uh, is a subsidiary of uh, a bigger group, uh, Larsen and Tubo, which is first uh, a group that has grown uh, in, in the construction and engineering uh, business. And this group has grown um, in, in different regions, uh, providing, uh, providing infrastructure to different clients, uh, among them some, uh, well, some French, French clients. Um, LTI has been um, has been uh, uh, created uh, more than 20 years ago, um, and is the uh, was initially the IT uh, arm of the uh, Larsen and Tubo group, uh, which has become over the years uh, a pure IT service and consulting company, uh, and that has been uh, growing. Uh, at at uh, at uh, exponential pace in uh, providing digital uh, uh, transformation services, combining uh, two things: technology expertise, but also, and this is one key element in uh, in uh, in our growth and establishment in Europe, providing um, strong expertise in 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 the business. And uh, coming to, uh, um, to, to your question, um, why uh, France is an attractive uh, um, base for, uh, for our group. First, it came naturally uh, through the Larsen and Toubro group, having a strong relationship with a French company, uh, and, and, and strong relationship with the industry ecosystem in France, whether it is in the energy and utility sector, whether it is in the um, manufacturing sector, or in the aerospace and defense sector. We uh, landed in, uh, in, uh, in France through that uh, heritage, through the group, naturally, I would say, and uh, progressively, um, LTI decided to, uh, to, to grow in a strategic manner in France, um, acknowledging the, the, the rich fitment between, um, between France and India uh, um, business and, uh, and, 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 and making sure that yeah, we bring value to, uh, to, 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 to the French industry. So uh, um, based on that, we have been able to grow significantly uh, our business in France. LTI, it is today 1,000 people serving French customers, uh, 200 people based out of uh, uh, France. And uh, um, this has been a, a growing journey. This is all, always a, a growing journey. We are settled in uh, Paris mainly, but we have also presence uh, across uh, across region in uh, in France. And uh, and this is uh, very important to say. This is also uh, um, uh, important to recognize that it is quite easy for us. Um, thanks to our business, to, uh, um, uh, to, to, to settle down in different regions and to have this flexibility. The France region offers a lot of facilities and uh, funding to help settling down in, in the region. And this is really well appreciated and really useful uh, for, uh, for our business. So in conclusion, the natural fitment of uh, um, the, the, our business 
in, uh, in France is, has been key in uh, attracting and making France as a strategic uh, region for, uh, for LTI and for LNT. You're on mute, Artus, I guess. Sorry, managing to do that. Um, thank you very much, Marie-Pierre. So um, uh, as, as I understand from what you said, obviously uh, it's not just possible, but it's also really beneficial for an industrial and technolog technological group as yours to work yeah. from outside Paris and be based in, uh, in different regions, such as the Eau de France region. Yes, definitely. Uh, it's, um, it is, first of all, necessary to be close to our, uh, our client and customer, but it's quite easy to settle down in, in those regions. And uh, we are very well welcome uh, when we, uh, we, we decide to uh, invest in those regions. And it's, it's quite efficient. So, um, and again, I, I share uh, the, 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 the point of view also of my uh, uh, TCS uh, colleagues, I would say, uh, with whom we are in, in, in the same business. Uh, the, uh, uh, attract, the attractiveness of France is also in, in our business, especially in the IT and in the digital business, is uh, uh, the, 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 the reason of uh, our attractiveness is our ta pool talent uh, and uh, the ability to uh, also uh, um, have access to uh, to large and qualified uh, uh, pool of, uh, of, of, of talent in France. Thank you very much, Marie. Yeah, so maybe one last question before, before wrapping up. Uh, you spoke about the different partnerships, uh, or at least the different clients you had uh, in France. So how important is it uh, to be in a country where you have a large number of uh, very large and uh, uh, internationally minded uh, industrial and techno technological companies uh, such as those that you had mentioned, uh, Schneider, Total, or, or NG. I mean, how important is it to have these kind of companies uh, ready to work with? Uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it is strategic for us. Huh? Uh, those, uh, uh, those companies are uh, uh, one of the biggest on, in their industry, and uh, uh, we are partnering with them at a business level and at an IT level, and that has been the key reason for us to... Uh, to to invest also uh, in, in France. Uh, partnering with the, the, the biggest, I would say, leaders in, in their market uh, is, uh, is, is obviously uh, uh, very attractive and, and make this relationship uh, strongly strategic. Thank you very and much, and, and And this uh, is true for uh, other clients also. But, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, go ahead. One. Yes. One thing I'd like to add is we've got. I think all our industrial companies have got a great support from the French government during COVID crisis. I mean, I had, as you know, all our plants were closed during a few months, and uh, we had a, a extreme decrease of production, and we still could get and pay 80% of the net salary to our employees with extremely strong government support, which helped not destroy for the long term employment in uh, in France and uh, not destroy uh, industries in various sectors. And that's important because I think it's a long term commitment in uh, to the industrial companies in France. And I guess it was a bit the same in the service companies. This, this, yeah, is, uh, this is perfectly true. I, I fully uh, agree with you, Eric. That has been a key uh, and key and positive points uh, to sustain our business and, uh, and to support our client. And that's been really seen as a, as a positive uh, point. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's all the more important that it's Indian companies that the French government was happy to support, not just with state guaranteed loans like the Pre Guarantee par l'État, but also with, through furlough schemes. Thank you very much to all presenters. So wrapping up, if I try to summarize all the key points you mentioned, the French market is great, not just because of the high quality talent pool available, the fact that France is a big market, a really strong and developed industrial and technological uh, ecosystem, 
and the presence of large companies. And obviously, you also have all of that in the Eau de France region, which we will be happy to be your key link between your activities in Europe and your activities in the UK. Uh, so yeah, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Handing on over to you, Ludivine. Thank you, Artus. And thank you to all our you know, participants, company participants, you know, representing India, you know, setting up in France and for their valuable insight. I would like now to leave the floor to Mr. Thomas Musset, Nuclear and Renewable Energy Councillor and CA representative in India, to give us a brief on investment opportunities in France in key technologies, especially in renewable energy like hydrogen. Over to you, Mr. Musset. Thank you, thank you, and good morning and good evening to, to everyone. So, my name is uh, Thomas Musset. I'm a representative of the CEA, which is the French Atomic and Energy Commission in France, which is a French public organization dedicated to research and innovation. First of all, again, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to, to share some insight about CEA and its activities and how it contributes to France's attractiveness. The CEA is a key player in research, development and innovation at the European level with more than 20,000 staff and an annual budget of 42,000 crore. The CEA is at the forefront in several areas, including low carbon energy, nuclear and renewable energy, but also technological research for industry, digital bio biotechnology and medical research. I thought that was a presentation. It's possible to display it, uh, but it's okay. I will, I will, uh, I will move on. Yes, I will. Um, no, I will add it. I will just put it across. Okay, thank you. Um, but I will move on. The, the CA is one of the leading patent applicants in France and in Europe with around 7,000 active patent families. And in 2020 only, the CA filed more than 700 uh, new patents. As a major player in innovation, the CEA promotes the technology develops and transfers them to the French and foreign industrial companies. It also looks forward to attracting investors for current or new projects. As that been mentioned by Eric Fajol in introduction, this process is fully supported by the French government to uh, use the basic research and to look for industrial uh, applications. Um, in 2020, the CEA had more than 700 ongoing or new partnerships with startups, small and medium companies, and also major corporations. And the CEA also has been setting up startups around its own technology for more than 20 years now. And to date, more than 200 startups have been created uh, during that period. And of course, we are looking for investors. We are looking to uh, industrial company that we are ready to, uh, to invest in such uh, startups. The next slide, please. I will just give you some, uh, a few insights about key issues that uh, the CI is working on. As I said, the first one is uh, low carbon uh, energy production, but also energy efficiency and circular economy. On solar energy, the CIA is working and has developed uh, high efficiency photovoltaic cells and modules. And high efficiency means that these cells are dramatically advanced compared to the current market product. Uh, first, it is called the Etero Junction. It is a new, new technology. And the first factory is already in operation in Europe. And other factories are also uh, under discussion. We also work on the optimization of how to integrate such a cells and solar panels in the grids. Um, we also work on energy storage. We some uh, research on the improvement of the lithium ion batteries, for example. We also work on the hydrogen uh, production and how to use hydrogen to work to, for, for example, transport application or energy storage. Um, just some example of what we are doing in India right now. Our main objective is to identify industrial partners, Indian industrial partners, who may be interested in um, development joint projects or to use technology developed by the CEA that may be suitable to the Indian markets. And also, of course, discuss, discuss potential investments in, uh, in France and in CEA activities. Um, 
So just an example, it's on this slide you have uh, we have an ongoing project to uh, to set up a, a pilot uh, e-vehicle charging station, which is uh, powered by solar panels and with embedded batteries. This is a joint project with a French industrial partner, Blue Solution, which is a subsidiary of uh, Bolloré Group. And we are currently looking to uh, an Indian partner and a suitable site for this project. Um, next slide, please. I would like to say a few words about another uh, topic of interest of CA and where we are looking for investors or cooperation with, uh, with foreign companies, is the digital transition. The CA is an expert in the field of electronic and digital technology and is able to design, build, and manage an innovative technology platform in various areas. It goes from the micro and nano electronics to the work of the Internet of Objects and the development of artificial intelligence, and also quantum technology, for example, the optimization of the calculation for the future quantum uh, computer. So, uh, as a conclusion, I try to be as brief as possible uh, due to the, to the time. The CEA is um, looking for industrial partners, both Indian and France, Indian and, and, and French uh, cooperation, who may be interested in implement new technology or to carry out researches on, on new technology. And we are looking to discuss potential partnerships or investments in new projects or in uh, current uh, working startups that, that we have. So it was a very brief presentation, but I am at your disposal for any question or further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Musse. Uh, I think you know we can have like few minutes, you know, uh, for one or two questions from our audience to our uh, guest panelists. Uh, so please, you know, if you have any question, you can raise the hand or, you know, uh, or just write the question in the chat box. Okay, Ludivine, I think we will answer the question by email from the chat. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think, you know, it's uh, time for us now to, uh, uh, you know, for or choose France, you know, Investors Day to almost end. And uh, before ending, I would like to invite Mrs. Foyle Canver, Director in the French Chamber of Commerce, if you to add a final address to our audience. Over to you, Payel. Thank you, Ludivine. Can you hear me well? Very well. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today for the Investors Day 2021. I think you'll all agree that it was a very informational session and we've uh, learned a lot about France's potential as an investment destination and also the practical aspects of doing business in France. So to summarize, France is clearly a key destination which represents a huge opportunity for foreign investment um, by way of its strategic location, its strong position in the EU, its connectivity, and also all the business friendly reforms that have been introduced by the French government. Uh, thank you very much to all of our experts for your presentations. It was also great to hear from our companies about their experience across sectors uh, like pharma, IT and automotive. And I think their presentations speak for themselves. And, and it was so interesting to learn that uh, some of these investments are the largest ones that have been done by the companies internationally. Um, don't forget to check out the documentation which is readily available. Uh, we had a presentation earlier by EY on the France uh, on France attractiveness survey, so you can check that out. And there are also uh, a number of reports on Choose France. So to uh, to conclude, a big congratulations to Business France and the entire team. This was a fantastic session. I'd like to also thank all of the partners, CII, North France, so North France Invest and Région Hauts-de-France, 
expat partners. I think that sketch was very, very interesting and unique. And of course, to the Indo-French Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which I represent. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon or a good evening. Back to you, uh, Anshika. Thank you so much, Payal. And with this, we end our session. And please do not hesitate to uh, write to us. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, doubts, we'll be happy to uh, answer you back. And we have definitely taken a note of all the questions which have been there in the chat box, and we'll soon get back to you on that. Thank you, and have a nice day. Thank you very much, everyone. See you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.